Welcome on board Safari Live. We have got an awesome, awesome morning lined up. Thanks to all of your reports about the sable that was seen at the Juma Waterhole last night. Can you believe it? And it was just a few days ago we were chatting about a sable, and I've never seen one in the Sabi Sands, so hopefully this morning will be different. First, though, we did come to check up on the Inkahuma Pride and their buffalo kill. There's not a lot left to see, Tebs, if you don't mind just panning across there. This is where they were feeding last night. You can see where all the grass has been flattened around the base of this weeping wattle. And under the kind of right-hand portion of where the base of the tree is, right where Tebs has got the camera now, was where I saw four lioness finishing off the carcass last night at around 8.30. Popped in for a quick checkup, and it looks like the hyena have come in and completely removed the carcass. There's not even a bone in sight. The poor old vultures, and I don't know, Tibbs, if it's possible maybe to get a silhouette of them. It's very, very dark, but they are sitting up there. Still, you can vaguely make out their silhouette. And their gamble is not paid off, sadly, because the hyena have stolen all of the little scraps that they were hoping to feed on. So, tough luck for the vultures, good luck for the hyena. And we can move off now and keep an eye out as to where these lion could have gone as well as where the sable could have headed. Now, we are aware that it was heading east along Central Road um, after crossing the Juma Waterhole. If any animals turn, the, the, the Juma Waterhole um, dam wall basically runs north-south. So if they're heading away from the camera, they're heading north. If they're heading towards the camera, they're heading south. And if they go left or right, it's west or east, respectively. Well, interestingly, there's a little bit of rain falling. That's why I've got the VR rig covered. And Linda Barnes, you'd like some further directions as to what's what and where's where in relation to the Juma Cam. And if you are looking up towards the camp, that would be in a kind of westerly position compared to where the dam cam is faced. So if anything heads up towards the, the camp, the direct line, that would be a westerly direction. And thank you so much again to all of you who did send us through those updates. There's a long list of names. John, Kevin, Leslie, Beryl, Zumi, Jody, Molly, Shannon, Diane, and still many more. So thank you very much. And now the search begins for what is an incredibly beautiful antelope. He's a fine specimen as well. Just checking some tracks here, though some lion tracks but I think from earlier on in the whole episode regarding the buffalo kill because vehicles have driven over some of their tracks it will be interesting to work out where in fact they have headed those five in Kuhuma lioness time will tell and I'm sure we'll find some tracks fairly soon now Jamie has headed out on the other vehicle so she's out and about with VM on camera and she's going to check the northern boundary and I'm going to be checking the southern boundary doing the kind of pincer movement working back towards where we think we're going to find this sable. Now uh, Mary Margaret would like to know if sable are typically solitary animals because that individual was seen all alone and Mary, how it works is the sable, kind of like wildebeest, I guess, will, um, actually, I don't know, to be honest, the fine details, because I've hardly ever seen them or viewed them, and therefore I don't know a huge deal about them. But I'm guessing 
that they've got a similar kind of social structure to uh, wildebeest who will join up with females when there's time for mating and an old bull like that individual we saw he's a huge fine specimen may have now kind of lost temper and lost the ability to mate or he's simply waiting for the rutting season before he gets involved with some females. So either they have a harem structure, maybe you guys can help us where males will stay with females for extended periods of time like a zebra, or old bulls will fall away from those herds just like a zebra stallion. Thank you very much, Diane, who has already done some research and says that the males are usually solitary, only meeting up with the females with when there are opportunities to mate. And the females are usually in herds of in and around 20. Lots of hyena tracks heading down this road. Um, a nice sign of where the lions may have gone. So to keep searching for them but why don't you guys go across to Jamie and get an update on how her morning's coming along so far. Good morning everybody and welcome to a well what was a slightly drizzly sunrise safari. Now I know that Scott's been updating you on the fate of the kill from last night. Just just before we went live VM and I discovered a hyena drinking at Gallego Pan. It looks like that adult that was at the den a couple of days ago, the one with a, quite a in, fresh injury on its bottom. And Caroline, I know that you sent through that update and a couple of others as well, and thank you for that, that you heard at about 2.30, you heard hyenas or sounds of hyenas fighting at the dam, the Juba Dam. You couldn't see the actual fight happening, and then a couple of them went wandering into the pan itself. And this hyena that we saw earlier was covered in mud all over its face. I wonder, I mean, there's two options. They might have caught something and they were squabbling over the kill, or it stashed something, a piece of a kill within the dam self, which is very, very common uh, hyena behavior. They pop it there to hide the scent, and I actually think they quite like the taste. again today with Signal and I know she was just discussing the reports of the hyena splashing around in the Juma waterhole last and it sounded like there was a little bit of an altercation before the Zumi managed to get a, the camera onto them so who knows exactly what could have happened but interesting stuff and again thanks for those updates. to Barbara and yes isn't it remarkable that hyena will use little ponds and water holes as a pantry to store their meat and a clever because most other carnivores of their size and predators of their size don't like water at all so a lion leopard and wild dog will typically avoid water at all costs, at least in this area of South Africa. It varies in other parts of Africa, like Botswana, where there is a lot of water. But here, yeah, they don't like water, and by hyena thinking cleverly, they've worked out that by putting chunks of meat in there, not only do they keep it away from other hungry mouths, but it also has a kind of stewing effect. So it'll slowly probably soften whatever portion of meat or bone they've put in there, making it easier to crunch. That combined with the fact that obviously it's difficult for other hyena even to smell where exactly that little portion of food is being stored away. So a very cunning maneuver used by the hyena. And I've only seen it on a handful of times, but it's one of the most awesome things seeing a hyena arrive back at one of these water pantries, water hole pantries, and to see them dig their, put their whole head under the water and then come up with this massive bone that they carry off. So 
uh, I presume you should keep an eye out for that happening. It could well happen in the near future. I'm wondering where the buffalo carcass ended up. Maybe a portion of it did end up in the Juma water hole. The remains of the Inkuhuma's kill. Kevin Catfish has interestingly just mentioned, is it normal for hyena to be sticking their whole head under the water? And there you go, Kevin, now you've got a better understanding as to why they will be doing that. Who knows, possibly if it didn't come out with any bones or any hunks of meat, it was a different hyena trying to work out where exactly something may have been uh, stored away by another hyena, so that is possible, I guess. Quite a lot darker this morning than normal. That's thanks to the clouds that brought us the most tiny amount of precipitation as we started out. But better than nothing, and at least it cooled things down temporarily, probably of absolutely no help to the poor vegetation that is extremely, extremely thirsty. I'm very surprised that neither Jamie nor myself has found any tracks of these lions yet. So, I wonder where they have headed. Difficult conditions to see tracks in though, so there's a chance we may have missed them. Tracking in the dark is a little bit extreme with, the, with regards to tracking conditions. Beautiful big sable. What a wonderful message to wake up to. And thanks again for that. Now, our job is to just follow through and find it for you. I don't even know what a sable's footprint looks like, so it'd be nice to work that one out along the way. I guess we'll just be looking for something unfamiliar to what we used to out here. to Siberia Zumi, who's done a bit more research on Sable and says that they like open air, so it'll be worthwhile checking that out. Um, we will certainly be checking the few open areas we've got on our area of traverse in the direction that that Sable was heading in, but to be honest, there are, uh, the, the only open area will actually be Cheetah Cut Line. Really in the direction it was heading. So open areas, as you know, uh, Siberia Zumi are not <laughs> that common here on Juma, so that's probably our first little problem, but there is a chance. And we are heading out towards um, Cheetah Cut Line now. I'm not too sure what Jamie's plans are regarding her car that's not working and whether she's just carrying on search but I'm sure I'll get an update with regards to her movements because it will obviously have a huge impact on what I decide to do. Well good, it sounds like things have been temporarily at least fixed on her vehicle so we're going to send you back to her right now. Unfortunately, Rusty's, Rusty's gremlins seem to be plaguing her over the last few days, but we seem to be back up and running. Hopefully it remains that way. And I think we are absolutely right when we put the rain covers on this morning. We said that it would immediately stop the rain by doing that. Always be prepared for something that in the end isn't going to happen. Uh, Scott's making his way towards Cheetah Cutline. I'm on Buffles for Cutline. Also, oops, sorry, just checking behind me. Also making my way in that direction. And as Scott said, we're sort of 
moving in a pincer-like movement to see if we can figure out, first of all, where the lines went, and second of all, where that stable went, which is so exciting. That would definitely be a first for me and Tuba, at least, and I think for all of the presenters here. I was in the middle of chatting about hyenas before poor old Rusty was plagued by gremlins. I was just saying that it's quite common for them to store parts of a kill. And I know that Scott carried on a little bit with that conversation. I think that's probably what was happening there. That hyena was so clearly dipped in mud and dirt, probably been sticking its head down into the pan itself, pulling it out. I'm not going to race across to the hyena den though. I want to see if lions at least are still around and if they are, where they are, in case they decide to go wandering and cut into Pliffelshook or Torchwood. and Kahuma lionesses. And Michael Fleetwood, you were wondering what happened to Junior and if he came to feed on the carcass or if he's permanently on his own now. And whilst I wouldn't necessarily go so far as to say he's permanently on his own, he's definitely moved off. He would be foolish at his age to stick around too much with the Birmingham boys. He is now of the age where he is a threat to them. Highly unlikely that they will accept him into their coalition at all. So I think for him, it's time to move on. And with male lions, they disperse far and wide. So it could be that we may never find out the end to Junior's story, unless maybe years later, he returns once again. I'm not saying that's definite, but I think that he is well on his way to moving out of home. He has been seen on and off every couple of weeks with the Nkuhuma Pride itself. But it really is getting to the stage where he must leave. It's time for him to go and be off on his own and hopefully find another young male or that's also on his own of a similar age and they can form a coalition together. It would certainly help matters for him, having a bit of company. Now, from what I know about Sable, they're generally slightly more open and slightly more arid areas. My experience with them has been that you usually find them in nice clearings. I've never ever seen a sable in the low felt though, so I've only ever seen them up more towards the Mapo Gugwe area where I used to work. Again, there's certain areas within our reserve. Obviously, the expedient of bringing you a live safari is the necessary, the necessary tangent to that is every now and again, there are signal black holes, particularly in the low areas where the signal can't bounce up to the repeater or however that, that works in general. But we were discussing the sable before we went through that dip and Kristen Elizabeth, you were wondering about whether or not sable are rare in general or if they're just rare for this area. They are particularly unusual to see in this area, but they are an antelope species that actually at one point was critically endangered and was slowly, and the, one of the big reasons is because they are such attractive animals that they were almost completely hunted to the point of near extinction. See, that was many years ago, but it's taken quite a few years of really concerted effort and game breeding to bring them back. They're starting to become more and more common, and they are actually bred in farms as well. There's lots of 
um, farmers who breed antelope species, including roan and sable. But it's particularly unusual to see them in this area. You could well see them in Kruger, up toward the more, towards the more northern areas. But it's really nice that that bull decided to pay us a visit. And he's huge, a nice big sable bull. And I'll tell you a funny story about sable. I've been charged at least twice by them. They can actually be quite scary animals when they want to be. They're large, they're strong, and they're quite aggressive. And it's not uncommon for them to fight back and win against any predator that tries to attack them. And I've had to go behind a tree once. The other time I got charged was whilst on horseback. It's quite an interesting experience being charged by an antelope. You're never quite sure exactly what to do with yourself. Do I, do I run? Do I climb a tree? Why is this antelope attacking me? And Rich in Chicago, you were wondering about what order the sable antelope falls under, and they are ruminants like all of the true antelope species out here. So ruminants, which groups them into both Shame. Again, just through what sounded like an interesting chat about the sable's digestive system, and there are in fact ruminants, as far as I'm aware, just like a lot of the general game we do see out here. They chew the cud, highly effective digestive systems. We are on Central Road, and this is the road that the sable may well have taken away from the Juma waterhole as he crossed over the dam wall. So I'm going to check here up onto Cheetah Cutline. If we don't have any luck, I'm going to probably head back to Gauri Cutline, which is another kind of open strip of road that's been cleared to act as a fire break. No different to Cheetah Cutline, which is the one open area I'm hoping to check. So. Basically what the guys have done is they've cleared both sides of the road so that there's not a high fuel load in case there's a fire that blazes through here. You cannot gain too much momentum. Still no sign of these lion, which is surprising. Considering the roads we've checked, I would have thought that they would have headed in to this kind of northeastern corner from the center of Juma. Maybe they're not lying up too far away from where they did have that buffalo kill because they're going to be quite full-bellied and probably quite lethargic after all that food. and you've got some more info through on the sable. Thanks very much for this. It's quite interesting. Um, you say that the sable bulls will be alone until they reach maturity and then they will join up with uh, a small bachelor herd. So that's interesting. Um, it doesn't make perfect sense in my head. Um, and what I can assure you is that that sable that was seen last night is certainly not a youngster. He is in his prime, if not past his prime. So I don't think it's applicable in our situation. And something always important to remember when reading up on any wild animals is that the information may be incorrect or the information may be applicable to animals in a certain area, not throughout sub-Saharan Africa where a lot of these animals will occur. So because a lot of them are so widely spread, their behavior will alter depending on the area that they're in. 
checking carefully here for any tracks using my flashlight to simulate the rising sun and just quite a lot of hyena movement here no obscure footprints that could belong to a sable at least not that i can see I'm guessing this is the same individual that has been seen at the Juma, uh, sorry, the Coral Waterhole a few times. So maybe what we'll do is we'll head south towards Coral and see if we can't scoop him along the way. are all being hugely helpful with the information on Sable, so thank you so much. The next nugget of information has come through from Sarah in Ohio, and she says that the track of the Sable looks very similar to that of an Impala. That track I do know, except larger and quite triangular and pointy at the tip. So that's perfect, Sarah. Now at least I've got a very good idea of what we need to look for. We do see some abnormally large impala tracks that lead us to the black beast. Shame, some of you probably don't know what we are looking for. So let me get, get a picture out. Angie in Ohio, and you would like to know if it's possible to age a sable by the size of its horns. And yes, Angie, I guess you'd be able to make a calculated guess as to how old it is, depending on the size of the horns. But what we need to remember is that genetically, option, genetically, they will all be slightly different to one another. So that's important to remember. You can only read so much into horn size. Jamie's just trying to get a hold of me, so let me chat with her quickly. Go ahead, Jamie. Uh, in course of at least one Maduro and Gala coming from Buffalo Hook along Buffalo Hook East. I'm going to try and follow up, but depending on my signal, I might have to move back towards the western edge of Juma. Okay, copy. Great news. Um, thank you. I've just reached Cheetah Cut Line uh, on Central, and I'm going to head south quickly just to make sure the sable hasn't gone along there, and then I'll, I'll race back north to give you a hand. Okay, well, there's some exciting news. Tracks of a male lion that Jamie's found heading towards the Buffalo Dam, but as you know, she is having trouble with her signal, so we may need to head into that area, and then she'll be able to head. Yeah, I'm getting there eventually. It's taking a while. It's probably because I'm looking in the index to German names. There we go. English will work better. Okay, so this is the antelope we are looking for. A beautiful big male sable. Copy that, thank you. The females are brown in color, as you can see. And that's what all the fuss is about. You can possibly hear the raindrops falling down a little bit harder now. And that's great. Sorry, Angie, you were asking about the ability to age sable by their horn size, and like I said, it all depends on kind of genetics, but the bigger they are, the older they'll be as a general rule. Tim's doing a raincoat. I think it's justified. The rain is coming down quite hard. I'm probably going to take the VR rig off from the, the hood of the vehicle as well, because I don't think my jersey is going to be giving it enough protection there my porous jersey. Okay, well, John, 
Jonathan in Chicago, one more question before we send you across to Jamie. And you would like to know how big can the sable's horns grow? Sure, well, you get um, a royal sable, which is slightly different to the sable that we see, whose horns are even far greater than this sable that we get this far south in Africa. Those are further north of us. And sometimes, I mean, there's reports of them curling back and touching them on their, on their shoulder blades. So, I mean, curling back and touching their body, absolutely massive, almost a full circumference of horn. So they do get big. In terms of inches and the exact length, I am not too sure, though. So I can't help you there with the finer details of their measurements. Good. Well, we're going to make sure everything is dry and not getting damaged and send you across to Jamie while we do so. is starting once again. The wildebeest has just spotted the tracks of a male lion coming towards Bookles of Dam, so we're going to follow up, see if he's hanging out somewhere around here. Exciting stuff. I wonder if maybe one of the Birmingham boys has decided to pay us a visit. It's a bit tricky. I, in this light, I'm struggling to see exactly how fresh it is. So it's hard for me to tell if it came through late last night or early this morning. It's been rained in, but then it's currently raining anyway, so that doesn't tell us terribly much. It's now just a question of guessing where he decided to go from here. And who knows, we might just bump into that sable that Scott is showing you a picture of as we come around. Scotty's just filling everybody in on the Gabe Drive channel. You were just saying that the rain must smell incredible and earthy. Absolutely. It's fresh, it's clean. And for all of us, whenever we get even the lightest smattering of rain, apart from the fact that it means that our cameramen have to act as windscreen wipers, it does actually do us and well, gives us an enormous feeling of well-being. Just that little bit of rain can make enough difference to get the grass growing green again, the trees getting their leaves back, and we're all starting to wilt at one point. Come to Buffles of Dam, I don't see any tracks coming through. I wonder if he decided to cut towards Torchwood. Yes. Safari, you're saying it's raining and no more drought. I wish, I really wish, I wish it was properly raining in its own way. Uh, we need two weeks of solid drizzle to even start to make any kind of dent on how dry it is out here. And it's got to fill up the dams as well. And as you can imagine, that's no small feat when they're completely empty. And what we're experiencing now, unless things change, We'll probably only wind up with about one millimeter, two milliliters by the end of the day at this sort of, if it continues at this rate. So as lovely as it is, and it is a relief and the animals all enjoy it, it's still not enough to relieve us of this drought. Typically the average rainfall around this area, depending on whether we're in the northern Sabi sands or the southern Sabi sands, the south obviously has a little bit more rain, but you're probably looking at about an average of between 450 to 500 on an average year. That's the sort of standard amount that you need to keep things going. Last year, I'm not sure about this area because I wasn't working here, but last year I was about 100 kilometers away in a straight line and that reserve had about a fifth of their average rainfall. I imagine it was something similar for this, this particular area. And this year in the entire wet season so far, which ends in about March, April, we've had 50, maybe 70 mils of rain. So you can see why we've still got a long way to go before it actually acts to properly relieve the drought. That being said, it's still wonderful to feel it particularly after last night's muggy feeling. It was 
was hot and sweaty. It's nice to have the relief and maybe it's just the beginning of a cold front slowly blowing through. And the rain might get a little bit harder. I certainly hope so. driving around with no idea as to where the morning might take us and for example the other morning we came around the corner and there was a two meter long black mamba lying in the road that then proceeded to give us probably the best black mamba sighting I need to rush my sentence in case I start to disappear again. Safari Live Facebook page. So it sounds like you were... Uh rushed away from Jamie there again as she lost signal. Apologies for that. Hmm. Some quite triangular tracks. They are after the rain. Um, they are down to our right over here, and in this flat light, you're probably not going to be able to see too much. But they are, it's that track there that's caught my attention. Again, it, it's impossible for you to see in this flat light, but you can kind of see. So, I'm not, con I'm not convinced that that is disabled, but. Possibly, I'm thinking more that it's water back. Um, we're just making sure. We are on our eastern boundary here. And we cannot search any further to the left, but I'm hoping we may get lucky and find this animal somewhere up ahead here. Hello to Molly B, who is interested to know my thoughts on whether the sable has come to Juma in search of water. Um, quite possibly, but the interesting thing with sable is that the reason why they don't occur here anymore, whereas they used to occur here in abundance, they're actually shot for rations, and is because they are not a water-dependent antelope. So they will be happy to travel many, many miles every few days in order to have one big drink. So maybe twice a week they'll travel 30 miles in order to find water and then move back to very dry areas that they prefer to be in. So. The Sabi Sands is littered with many watering holes now, and, and they're artificially made, and that's probably a big reason why the sable are no longer here in the densities that they were many years ago. And so I don't think it's water that's brought it here, and possibly more food than anything else, um, and maybe the fact that it has become drier has started suiting this individual better because there's less water around than there normally would be at this time of year. Whereas had we had, had our normal rainfall and there was water in all the water holes, it would probably think about being elsewhere in a drier area. Did we 
difficult to know exactly, um, but it's, it, it, it's, it's unlikely that it's here in search of water because they are not water dependent like other antelope. much to Siberia Zumi for yet another wonderful nugget of information regarding sable and their lifestyle and the fact that's just come through is that they are predominantly grazers feeding on grass but will also feed on leaves in times of desperation i.e. now. So if we do find this animal we could expect to see it both grazing and browsing. Jamie's found a hyena. We've got a hyena here. And it's playing very hard to see, moving straight into a very dense patch of vegetation. You can see a tail moving through the block. Oh dear disappeared off into the drainage line. Oh, we tried, but it was on the move, probably on its way back towards the den. I wonder where it's yeah. heading to. Actually, that reminds me, when I came around the corner, I saw a harrier hawk being mobbed by grey hornbills, which is also fascinating, but I think it's already managed to escape them. The hyena, that particular hyena as well, also had a face full of mud. I'm not sure if it was raiding Torchwood's dam. logged on to YouTube and um, <laughs> obviously then logged off again and then came back on and said this is not a live feed because she was driving in the dark before and Penelope we really enjoyed your retort just by the way Penelope has said that Snazzy Potato perhaps missed the whole earth rotation deal that causes the whole day and night effect so Snazzy Potato, if you ever happen to log back onto the show, and of course we always encourage you to do so, um, sometimes in Africa, as it does in other parts of the world, it gets lighter in the morning. And then what sometimes happens as well is in the evening, and I say sometimes happens, it's a really unusual case, this particular aspect, but at night, in the late afternoon, it actually gets darker. <laughs> Thanks, Penelope, we enjoyed your, you provided us with a couple of chuckles there. <laughs> uh, at some point, unfortunately, we are going to have to pop back to the camp and see if we can replace the cable that seems to be creating extra problems for poor old Rusty. Rusty appears to be in the wars. And actually, speaking of people who appear to be in the wars, I don't want to speak too soon because he's on his way to the doctor this morning, but it looks as though poor old Brent has got tick bite fever. So the combination of the Nyala trying to climb into his lap, there's one to show you. And now tick bites. He's feeling very sorry for himself, but he will be absolutely fine. He just needs a quick course of antibiotics. Beautiful male. ivory tips to those horns. Beautiful big male. Probably about four or five years old at this point, with a full twist to the horns. Part of the spiral horned antelope family. And of course, all united by the twirls in their horns. And that grey coat that is so indicative of male in Yala. Definitely one of the most striking antelope that we have out here. 
I wonder if he's a bit confused as to why it's so light this morning. <laughs> and enjoying the rain probably, picking up on the moisture around the glass, grass blades as well as having his breakfast. You can see the ridge of fur along his back that he's more than capable of fluffing up, making himself look big and scary. But unfortunately, playing very camera shy this morning. open view of him. Hello. Also a member of the ruminant family. And to give you an idea, I know Scott showed you a picture of that sable that we're looking for. That sable is probably at least half a metre taller than a big male in Yala, and they're not small antelope by any stretch of the imagination. And sable actually fall under what is known as the horse family of antelope. Oryx, roan, sable, all have very bulky, quite stocky bodies compared to the slender grace of the spiral horned antelope family. And of course, another big exception, the Nyala males have horns, the females don't, but sable that prefer open areas, both the males and females have horns that they use in, as I said earlier, in defense of their offspring. They can't run and hide in thick, dense vegetative cover. And as he wanders through, I know that when I went through a patch of black signal, and I'm actually quite wary of moving the car even now, but Sharon, I was in the middle of chatting to you about that black mamba sighting, and then I disappeared off the broadcast. And Sharon, yes, there is a video. You'll be able to find it on the Safari Live Facebook page. It's sort of a highlights from that particularly impressive morning. Quick link to Scott, he's got something. <laughs> I got so excited, I thought we had found the sable and wasn't taking any chances. What we have found is not the sable, but another dark antelope called an Inyala. <laughs> Whoops. But, like I said, I wasn't going to take any chances and I was just running through the thought process in my head there's the sable. Oh, look here, on the left, right in front of the vehicle. Can you believe it? Hello. Morning. What can we do for you? Hey? Shane, you're getting a bit too close. We can't even see you anymore. Would you like some shelter and our vehicle? The hyena looks soaking wet. Oh, here it is. Right next to the right-hand side of the car. You can... Moving right alongside me. I'm trying to move out the way. You can just see it's fur sticking up, and it may put its head up right next to my door. Hello. What is catching your attention? Can you smell the lion? Here it is. Yeah, you'll be able to see it now. There it goes. You can see it's been lying in a mud wallow. Its body's entirely wet. That's not from the rain. And I wonder what it can smell. I mean, probably the scent of lion from where we were driving around, and also that buffalo carcass. When I parked in that area earlier this morning, we drove over the rumen, the stomach content of where that buffalo was actually killed. And obviously there also have been a lot of hyena scent, as well as lion scent, gathered onto our tires. And isn't it an incredible sign of how good its sensors are? It came straight up to our vehicle to work out where these smells are coming from. It's still walking behind us now, trying to work out what on earth is going on. So a little bit confusing for this hyena, but here it comes again. Sorry, is this all a bit confusing for you? Don't worry, it was a long way off where we had I could literally reach out and touch it on the nose. I mean, that's how close we are. I'm not going to do that. Hello. Hey. Oops. 
we got a bit of a fight. Um, and absolutely awesome. It's certainly intrigued by the smells from our vehicle. Well, I'm glad we raced you across to us anyway, because um, the false sable at least got us this cool sighting with a very inquisitive hyena. Sacrosanct, you know a little bit about South Africans and what they love snacking on. A delicacy called biltong, which is dried meat, essentially like jerky, I guess. And Sacrosanct was asking, can he smell the biltong on the vehicle? And I wish he could. It would be great to have some biltong for breakfast. He's just seen the false sable, the Inyala. And I think it's a male hyena. It could be a female, but judging by the size, it looked like it could have been a male. I'm not sure if any of you recognize that, any of our hyena wizards. just made a comment saying I'm looking freshly groomed and maybe it's that smell of a freshly groomed human that's throwing off this hyena, causing it to be extra inquisitive. No, no. Uh, and Yana just changed direction and moved off in the opposite direction. I'm not too sure if it's an inter Nyala dispute or what exactly is going on. Jorgensen who would like to know how many twists will a male in Yala have in its horns? I don't have the faintest idea, Brian. Um, but if I had to guess, maybe about four. Oh, listen. I don't know if that's a bird. It is a bird. Strange call, but it got the hyena quite excited for a moment and it kind of hopped off in that direction. At first I thought it could have been a small antelope. Complaining. Just gonna listen carefully. Just to see if we don't get any more audio. No, all clear. short it's not very easy to see the twists of a nyala's horn they're not as prominent as the corkscrew turns of a kudu um it's all just one big twist really in my mind but there will be i guess a start and a finishing point for one once it's done a full rotation I do know about the twisting in Yala horns is that as well as the kudu and the bushbuck to a degree they're all spiral horned antelopes the three spiral horned antelopes that we get in this area and that they have got little ivory tips on the end and those are good indicators for a bull being in its prime will be about an inch or an inch and a half of white horn right at the tip saying, uh, but I got a little bit thrown off by the hyena that came onto the scene, is just before 
I saw the Inyala that I thought was Sable. I was wondering just this very question that Michael has just sent through, and he would have liked to know, how would the Sable react to the vehicle? Is it habituated? And I doubt it. Um, I don't think it's going to be hugely relaxed with the vehicle. We may be pleasantly surprised if we find it. But the reason why I don't think it's habituated is that it's not a, a local resident here in the Saudi Sands. And it probably comes from further north in the Manyaleti, where Sable are seen, which is not a busy property with very few roads and not that many people driving around. It's not a good place for animals to be habituated there. Even though they are northern neighbors, leopards will be extremely elusive. And even though their density of leopards will be fairly similar to here, you won't see them nearly as much as we do here. And when you do, it's just going to be a fleeting glimpse. And I'm guessing that the sable is not going to be hugely welcoming to the vehicle. So that's why I didn't take any chances. I saw that dark shape and thought, let's get the camera rolling as quick as possible in case it did run off. Thankfully, it was a very calm and yala that you all got to see. <laughs> Hello, Rain, just 15 years old, and you ask a good question. You're wondering whether or not the animals will be a little bit afraid or unsure of the sable, because they're also not used to seeing it, just like, I guess, the sable's not used to seeing us in vehicles. Um, to a degree, um, I think they're going to be more understanding of its presence because it's four-legged, it looks like an inyala, I guess. Um, it looks like an antelope, but most of these animals will be fairly used to seeing. So I don't think that they're going to react hugely differently to it. They're going to treat it just like other antelope. Okay, but it would be interesting to see. It, it really would be interesting to see, right? <laughs> well, a uh, comment that I've been waiting to come through from Carol. And She's pleading for the lions not to eat the sable before we get to see it. And we were all having a laugh this morning that the Impahuma lioness were going to be eating the sable alive for the opening shots. But that didn't happen. We weren't sure whether it was going to make the Impahuma lioness famous or infamous. Um, but what's interesting is that sable are quite aggressive and they often stand up to animal like lion, quite similar to buffalo. And that's the reason why they typically don't do very well in areas with a lot of moisture and a lot of water. And probably why they've moved out of the Saudi sands is because there may not have been as many predators here and as many antelope here many years ago, but as soon as water was put here, it became a more attractive place for both predators and prey. And that's why a lot of the water holes that were opened in the Kruger National Park have actually been closed, because it allows animals that ordinarily would not have lived there to live there. So they're going to be more lion giving the sable a hard time. And in, over many, many years, sable have become used to being in areas where maybe there weren't as many lions and weren't as many other antelope. And that's why they can be quite bullish and aggressive when confronting lion, which can sometimes obviously not work out that well for them because they don't have the size and power of the mighty Cape Buffalo. So often the lions work them out and eventually jump on their back and kill them. So some interesting thoughts there on the sable and their slightly aggressive nature. I've never seen this, it's just what I've been told. <clears throat> and I've had very few sable sightings in my life, sadly, so let's hope we get lucky. While we continue into the general area where Jamie is, what last I knew she was there, with those male lion tracks, we're going to send you on to her vehicle for an update. that it was a 
control for when we do find the stable. But unfortunately now the cat's out of the bag and we all know that it was an Inyala. Yes, stable definitely capable of <laughs> definitely capable of defending themselves against attack by lions. Uh, male Inyala, less so. But I can see it, it's a dark antelope. It's entirely fair. We are racing back. As you can see, the rain is starting to come down. I'm returning back to DRC. One, to get a new cable for Rusty, and two, because it's starting to get quite heavy out here, which is great, great news for the landscape and the animals, but it does mean for our equipment. We just have to make sure that we're thoroughly sealed up. I'm not sure how long this is going to last, though, so don't count us out just yet. We do have rain covers. We will be able to carry on but I just wanted to update you we're coming up to DRC now as you can see we are slightly damp it is a little bit drenched most of it's coming in from the west unfortunately due to rusty signal oh it's starting to pull it's starting to pull down my lower back <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> We can't go east to where it's not draining. I'm going to send you back across to Scott since we've just arrived at DRC. We'll be hopefully back up and running very shortly. Really, it's quite pleasant driving around in the rain. And when I was a regular guide and we didn't have to worry about all the equipment, it was actually great fun being out. It's, uh, experience that most people actually haven't really been involved in in a lifetime on the planet because usually when it's raining you seek shelter. But there's something quite invigorating about being out amongst it in an open vehicle. Um, but obviously, as you all know, we've got a lot of high-tech equipment on these vehicles to get the pictures out to you. And we don't want to ruin that. But there's good news. We've agreed on a revised version of the current rain system which I've called the sieve and hopefully it won't be too long before we get a, a proper system in place that will allow us to stay out for longer so that's something to look forward to it's in the pipeline it's been approved and we have got a design that we put forward in the past that was relegated but it is now going to be given a shot after the sieve has proved hopeless. That's something to look forward to. in South Bend, Indiana, and you would like another tutorial just to clear up which directions which with regards to the Juma waterhole. So, Lucy, um, basically, if you look at the dam wall, now the camera is here on the tree, and the dam wall is somewhere here, correct? Um, the dam wall is pointing basically directly north and obviously directly south. Now forward, which is easy, is north. So the direction you're looking in is north. The direction towards the camera, this way, to, if they were walking along the dam wall towards the camera, that would be heading in a southerly direction. And then obviously if you bisect that, you'll get east and west. So the lodge is west or that little inflow that feeds into the uh, Juma Dam that is now dry comes from a westerly direction running east and the drainage system, the Muwatu bed that, 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 that is on the other side of the dam wall, here's the dam wall again, that flows away, is kind of in an easterly direction, but it does bend and weave and it can be heading east at some points and south at others, but generally you get the gist of it, 
The down wall is your north-south access, and you can work east and west out thereafter. So if, again, if the sable walked across the dam wall, he was heading north. If he continued straight into the bush and didn't take Mvubu Road, which is the road to the left, or Central Road, which is the road to the right, he would be heading directly north towards Buffalo Cutline. If he headed left on Mvubu, he would be heading west. If he headed right down Central, he would be heading east. So I hope that clears things up. Obviously, it's vitally important that we get the right information from you guys when following up. We've often been caught out by leopard who are seen at the Wattsall camera. We arrive minutes at later, and usually we get some quite confusing reports through as to which way to go, so that obviously doesn't help. Even when we do get the right information, even then, we sometimes cannot find the animals we're looking for. And of course, sunrise and sunset, which the zoomies often do film, are the perfect indicators for east and west. Oh, hello, Steph Buzzard. I hope you're enjoying Africa after a long trip from Russia, but not enjoying being in front of the camera. So off you go. Good work there, Tibbs. A lot of you are concerned about Brent's health, and let me assure you that Brent will be fine. He is not in any majorly dangerous situation, um, so don't worry about him. We're only an hour and a half away from the closest town, which is not far, and there is also a permanent paramedic based in the Saudi Sands can come out to any of these lodges if there isn't an emergency and he's got a Land Rover that's kitted out like an ambulance and he's here in order to be, to be able to treat people for trauma and obviously everything below that but he's kitted out for people who, are, who have been squashed by elephants or buffalo so I think Brent's spider bites is nothing to worry about so everyone can be calm and not worry too much about Brent. He has worked in far more remote locations and far more dangerous scenarios than his current spider bites. He obviously just wants to go and get some antibiotics, which you need a doctor's trip for in town. So it's far from life-threatening. you would like to know what tick bite fever is and basically it's a horrible sickness you get when bitten by certain ticks not all ticks if they bite you will give you this tick bite fever and I'm actually not too sure on the finer details as to what will cause you getting it or not I've only had it once but sadly I had it combined with hepatitis so it was a combo deal and I couldn't tell which was causing which symptoms, um, but it, was, it wasn't much fun, that I can assure you. But I think it was the hepatitis that got me more than the, the tick bite fever. And I've only got it on, on one occasion. One thing to look out for for any bites though is when they start going black in coloration, a small black dot left behind after a bite. Even though it might not be painful at that stage, that is a good indication of something that needs to be checked out. And usually that little black dot um, is there before you start feeling any major pain or symptoms. And that will be the necrosis kicking in, the flesh dying. <coughs> Oh, 
got some good news through from Jamie and VM, and they are making good headway on their tech issues and should be heading out fairly soon, so that's some good news. VM is a great guy to be stuck with whenever there is any kind of tech difficulty. He is a wizard when it comes to fixing just about anything. A good person to be stranded on an island with. safari yesterday and she sent through a very long comment all with very kind words and praise saying how much she loves the experience and Megan that's wonderful feedback thank you so much and it's great to have you on board with us now why don't you let us know where you're from Megan it's always wonderful to know where in the world all of our various viewers are watching and like I said you are very very welcome and you tuned in on a good day I mean yesterday afternoon we had some wonderful action but each day is different as already you're seeing today we've got a bit of rain keeping us on our toes the reports of the sable antelope last night there's always something exciting going on sometimes it's with the well-known stars in Africa and sometimes it's with some of the lesser and smaller known characters out here. But we're very fortunate to be traversing this wonderful reserve in northeastern South Africa. And who knows what we'll find this morning. Maybe we'll get lucky and find you a leopard. You wouldn't have seen one of those yet if you only tuned in yesterday. And this is one of the best places in Africa to see leopard actually, so you've come to a good spot. <laughs> Hello Lucy in South Bend, whose compass was not providing her with the correct directions initially with regards to what's what and where's where on the Juma cam. And it's a great pleasure, Lucy. Not a problem at all. You guys help us out so much with all of your reports that it's the very least we can do. Uh, let's go and take you on a quick little tour of what's at the dam. I thought you would have had a look with Jamie earlier. But let's go and have another quick squeeze. Probably be nothing really to see other than a dried up pan. Oh, there's some water leaking into my bottom on this poncho. Interesting sensation. <laughs> okay, nothing to see here. An empty water hole. So we shall continue. And smell some lion poo from the other day. And it sounds like Jamie is back out on the roads and she's found a little reptile for you. Look at this little guy already with the rain falling. He's decided to come out and have a drink. When we first came around the corner, he was trying to find some moisture on the road. We're just outside of quarantine, so I wonder whether or not it's the same, one of the same tortoises that I saw having a fight the other day. I saw two males clashing. He's been injured at some point earlier in his life. He's got a big scar through his shell or a big fault in his shell on the right-hand side. Probably some kind of lucky escape, quite possibly, or maybe an encounter with a hoof could have caused that, broken the shell and it's healed, slightly scarred. This is a Speaks hinged tortoise. Welcome to Max Pillow, who is watching on YouTube. And Max, you were wondering if we've got some cars and green screens up. 
because you were wondering if maybe at five or six in the morning, this isn't what you would expect it to look like. Oh, well, Max, welcome to our sunrise safari, and the sun has indeed risen in South Africa. That is where we are at the moment. We're in the greater Kruger area in the Sabi Sands of the northeastern corner of South Africa. So in terms of the latitude and the fact that we are actually in the middle of summer, we have been doing quite a lot of in the way of geography lessons today, Matt, but we are right in the middle of summer, so we've just passed our longest day of the year. And thus, at six o'clock in the morning, it is nice and light, if somewhat drizzly. fine form this morning, providing me with endless, <laughs> endless entertainment. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to leave that between Penelope and myself though. And just a reminder that as we progress through the year and the earth rotates around the sun as well as upon its own axis, the earth has a slight tilt to it, which changes the lengths of the days and also causes the seasons, so summer and winter. And as we start to move further out of summer and more towards autumn, the days are so going to start to get shorter and we're going to start going out later. At the moment we're going out in the pitch darkness and then as we explained, it does get lighter. It happens here in South Africa too. I'm sorry, I've got the giggles. <laughs> I can't. Um, so yes, we will be shifting times. For those of you, for regular viewers, we will be shifting times on the... Oh, that's where our lines went. They went up where Teller made access. Um, so yes, we'll, on the 1st of February, we will be shifting our times in the morning to half an hour later and in the afternoon, half an hour earlier. So we'll be going out at half past five Central African time and half past three in the afternoon. And we will continue to do that, obviously trying to keep as close as possible to the natural sunrise times. It's a bit tricky in half hour increments, but it does mean that you're out in the bush at the best time of the day. I'll try and show you what I'm looking at. I said the lions came through. Their paw prints are moving up the road. Those are lion tracks. Those are lion tracks in the six o'clock morning light in midsummer in South Africa. And I'm gonna hop out to show you a little bit of lion tracks. What I just need to do is set up our green screen to make sure maybe we get the green screen lines up ahead of time. Let me just show you the lion tracks quickly. So, if we can look at, which is the easiest one? This one maybe, will be. Cool. Cool, thank you. Now this is actually, I'm always amazed at the size of the Nkuruma females tracks. It's almost the size of my hand, just a little bit smaller and moving in this direction. How do I know it's moving in this direction? There's one toe, two toes, three toes, four toes. And then if we look at the back here, the back pad, one, two, three lobes. So this is the track that we're looking at here. I'm gonna draw it for you to make it clearer in the sand. I promise you there is actually a track there. I'm not just drawing it and then claiming that there is a lion track. Front foot here, back foot has fallen and just behind it. And the lionesses walked up this road sometime last night. Why do their feet look so big? Well, the sand is nice and soft here. This, these tracks are from last night, so before the rain. And in soft sand, lion's feet and all cat's paws tend to splay outwards slightly. So their tracks look bigger than they would in a hard substrate. And they're wandering up. And those three lobes I chatted about at the back, those are indicative of big cat tracks. So lions, leopards, cheetah all have the three lobes. A hyena's track, which would in a big female come to roughly the same size as this track, has two lobes at the back. Awesome. Our lions walked up this way. Let's go follow them, see if we can find them. I'm checking for sable tracks as well, just because you know, never know, we might be on a roll. I have to be honest though, I'm with Scott. I don't entirely know what a lion's, uh, what a sable's track actually looks like. 
I'm not sure I could identify it over a wildebeest track or a waterbuck track. Roughly the same size. I think they are slightly sharper. updated spot as well that's a sable track is like an impala track but obviously bigger and slightly pointier well, that's useful to know and when we do find our sable we'll be able to look at his tracks and um, you notice i'm saying when and not if we'll be able to observe what kind of footprints he, he leaves behind interesting thing with impala tracks they're what's known as rim walkers and i'd be fascinated if our sable was the same, which means the edge of the track is more pronounced than the center of it. That's awesome news. It seems as though Scott is going to come and join us on our lion slash sable expedition try and see if we can relocate where these Nkuruma lions went to at some point last night. Now, what was fascinating yesterday is despite the fact that they were fairly well fed, they were still out and hunting. So I wonder if last night, maybe with this cloud cover, a bit of wind, perhaps they were successful once again. species and love three dogs you were wondering with sable if they have a set breeding season they they do as far as i know they don't give birth in winter they give birth in the summer rainy season that being said it's not set quite to the point of the wildebeest and the impala which tend to drop their calves almost um, simultaneously or at least within a week's space of each other um, sable will be a slightly more extended period similar i suppose to buffalo is maybe quite a good example to the best of my knowledge that's the way that sable reproduce they try to have their babies around some peak wet season which makes sense particularly for an arid living animal that then has to produce milk so any kind of access to water is better than nothing the fascinating thing about sable is they have an interesting approach that's quite similar in a way to Steenbok and to Dacre. So with our baby Impala and our wildebeest, we see them with the herd the entire time. We never see them off on their own. But with something like a sable, a roan, and a, an oryx, all of the horse antelope, what they actually do is they hide, they hide their calves away. So they stick them somewhere in a bush when they're young, and they leave them there. It's usually about a month or two that those little ones are hidden away completely, relying purely on this tawny camouflage that they have. So the calves are a completely different color to the adults as a way of hiding them in the bushes. And basically the mother only visits them maybe once, maybe twice a day to go and feed them, but otherwise leaves them and leaves them to, doesn't want to draw attention to them, which is quite a fascinating productive strategy and obviously one that has been fairly successful in the areas that they're in. And what that means is that both roan counted both roan, oryx and sable calves on foot that have been from you, you walk almost on top of them because they're so camouflaged and so cryptically hidden. And they're sort of hidden away right at the base of the tree at your feet and they don't move. You can sit and watch them for ages. But you could. I generally don't. I've found when I've encountered them like that, I've moved away as quickly as possible. And the tracks, as we came around this corner, have just disappeared off the road. We were with them the entire time, right up until that point. I just want to figure out exactly where they went. I think they were veering more towards the Impala Plains side. Where are you? 
Let's check this junction thoroughly. Sorry guys, just going to concentrate on the tracks. Well, since Scott is making his way towards Sandy Patch, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Impala Road and just double check along there. See if they popped out. I think they might have cut the corner and come through here. So I'm going to check this side, and if Scott can check around Sydney's Dam and Sandy Patch Road, then we've got essentially all bases covered in theory. The tricky part comes now with the rain is that the soils become slightly harder. Although, hopefully, their tracks will have been here before the rain actually really started to fall, like the ones we saw on Main Access Road. What I should have done is actually swept aside a little bit of the sand on the track just to show you how you can age them if you know what time it rains and if you live out here of course you know what time the rain starts. It's a, quite a nice easy way of aging a track because you can check and see if in light rain the track the soil is dry underneath. and Teresa and many others you're concerned about Brent um, at the moment I said he has tick bite fever that's my bet Scott says it was a spider bite that's Scott's bet I guess at, he's going to the doctor today so we'll find out immediately either way neither of them are life-threatening it just it's made him feel quite ill his temperatures up a little bit um, so he's a bit uncomfortable his legs a bit sore I suspect it's tick bite fever, just judging by the way his glands have gone up. And just for those of you living in the States or in Europe, our tick bite fever is far less serious than the uh, Lyme disease that your ticks can pass on. And tick bite fever essentially is a disease that causes you, it feels like a bad flu, essentially. It feels like a horrible flu that makes your lymph glands, particularly your groin lymph glands pop up nice and hard and solid fighting off the infection and it's treated by a very rapid very brief course of doxycycline which is an antibiotic so it is it has that dual purpose and I promise you I I feel terrible for him but I'm not too concerned I'm sure he's going to be absolutely fine he just feels a little bit grotty shame poor thing is just the odd antibiotic and he'll be fine. And what's funny about it is that Brent, when I first got to know him, was convinced he was immune to bite fever. So that's kind of a little bit amusing because he's obviously clearly not. Let's see though, let's see if it's tick bite fever. I've stopped to have a look at the zebra but I don't think they're gonna come out and play nicely. There's no tracks popping out here, which makes me think that those Lines have gone north, not west. But I just want to check the triple M boundary as well at the same time. Let's see if we can't figure out where they went from there. Last night after the end of the sunset safari, the camp that we're in doesn't have any phone signal. It doesn't have any cell phone or mobile phone signal. And as a result, if you want to get any kind of signal, you go to outside of the gate. And I walked out last night after the end of the sunset safari to go and send a message through to home. And the impala was still shouting. And I was saying to Scott, Scott, I thought the lions had already left. You know, is there a leopard or something walking across quarantine? And I look up and 50 meters away, standing looking at me is one of the Inkuruma lionesses. So there was obviously a straggler. And I looked at her and she looked at me for a while and then she trotted off after the rest of the pride. It's always interesting to see the different ways animals respond to you in, um, in the way that they do. Animals know that people live in camps, so they're far more, weirdly, they're far more relaxed if you happen to pop out of a camp than they would be if you happen to pop out of the bushes next to them. It is like they know that we live there. So even on foot, I've noticed with elephants, with lions, they're much more relaxed. I see you. I see you. 
Hello, cutie. Oh, you a bit damp. <laughs> Little female steamboat. Looking a bit ruffled and damp. What's that around her eye? It's just dirt. They've got glands there, pre-orbital glands that secrete a hormone that they use to mark their territories. Ooh, she's winking at us. <laughs> you flirt. Hello, girl. Look at your huge ears. Oh, no wonder she's blinking. There's flies climbing all over her face and her eyes. Poor little things. As much as we think we're plagued by flies, they have it far worse. And I think she's trying to decide whether she wants to run away or whether it's better to freeze. The general standard Steenbock approach, which is either to freeze like this and rely on camouflage, although I have to admit, girl, it's not doing you any favors now. ears, huge eyes, an animal that, oh, good girl, you're nice and relaxed. Not often that we get to have a steerbook sighting like this, so we can all enjoy it. I love the white highlights over her eyes, they're like eyebrows. It's so fascinating. I've never really noticed that in steerbook before. This is what I love about this camera and the zoom effect that it has. Is that you get to notice little details that you might otherwise not have picked up on. Like her eyelashes framing her eyes. And for an animal that hides away in dense vegetation, and most of the vegetation out here has thorns, it's crucial as a way of protecting that eyesight. Oh, she's devouring that plant. considerable speed. Hey, little girl. The Steenbork males and females look very similar to each other, but the only difference is, of course, that the male has a tiny little spiked horns. And to give you a rough idea of scale, she, at shoulder height, would probably come up to my knee. It is one of the tiniest, tiniest little antelope species that we get out here. The only smaller one would be a Sharps Facebook, which we have yet to, as far as I know, we have yet to put on camera. They're quite rare little antelope, but they do occur here. And you never know, it's much like our sable search, constantly looking for new and unusual antelope to show you. I'm enjoying that. One ear poking backwards. Those incredible ears giving her a directional sense. And also a way of amplifying so she can look at us with one ear. Sorry, let me try and rephrase that. She can look at us and listen to us with one ear and then listen behind her with the other. Completely independent motion. Bye-bye, girl. And a question coming through from Dan in Los Angeles. You were wondering whether or not we get topi out here. And no, we don't. I think there are a type of antelope species, although now I'm feeling, now I'm starting to doubt myself. We definitely not one that occurs within Southern Africa, as far as I know. There's quite a few, oh, fly in my mouth. There's quite a few antelope species that I am desperate to see. They're still on my list of animals to, to go and find and observe. Oh, what's we got here? It's like a black chested snake eagle. Let's try and catch up with it. Well done, Bully. Nope. Didn't 
want to play nicely, but it was at the time being mobbed by all of these grey hornbills that we can hear whistling. Yes, you're victorious. Did you chase that eagle away? Fairly... This one's going to start. <laughs> announcing, announcing its victory to the skies. <laughs> so proud of yourself. And calling in response to one of them behind us. I did it. I chased an eagle away. It's going to be quiet so you can hear the call properly. <laughs> In theory. <laughs> Has to be calling though for you to be able to hear it. Cool. Grey hornbull. Nice to see them. I've noticed I'm seeing more and more of them over the last few weeks. I have no idea why that is. I don't know whether it's because some of the other bird species have moved out of the area in order to follow the rains. And as a result, the gray hornbills are being more successful. I really don't know. I just have noticed a tremendous increase in gray hornbills. And I've just remembered about the red-billed hornbill nest that I found at the lion carcass yesterday. So at some point we must pay a visit to that. It was so entertaining while I was sitting there watching the male come in and feed his chicks and you can hear all their little begging chirps. It's probably still at the stage, in fact, where they are entirely reliant upon the male because essentially what happens is the female goes into a hole in the tree and this applies for yellow, red and grey, like the one we were looking at, where they go into a hole in the tree, they block it up and then they the female goes in and lays her eggs and she sheds her primary flight feathers. And I keep forgetting about this tree, the roadblock of notes. And speaking about hornbills, and while I try and figure out where those lions have gone, Scott has found another one of the species to show you. So from the southern grey hornbull to the yellow-billed hornbull, you get a good idea of the differences between them. They are such wonderful birds, the hornbills. And these two look like a happy couple, spending the morning drying out after the little bit of rain we've got, before they start hunting for insects. Although it looks like one of them's ready to start looking for breakfast. And they will feed on small termites. So often, it's hard to even see what they are picking up with that big bill of theirs. So they can feed on tiny prey as well as prey up to the size of large chameleons. Which is always a bit of a catch-22 for me because I love both the hornbills as well as the chameleons. And then seeing one eating another, obviously, becomes a little bit tricky. You can hear a go grey go-away bird calling, quang, quang. Maybe that's what caused the hornbills to fly off. That little alarm, I can't see the bird of prey flying around. Um, who knows, possibly it was the same one that you guys saw with Jamie that's caused this commotion. I am in the same area as um, on our western boundary and Things are looking good. The lions haven't crossed north, or at least according to what I saw on the road, there's no evidence of them crossing north towards Sydney's dam. And now we just need to make sure that they don't cross west into Sibambili. And then we can start fine-tuning where they may be sleeping on Juma. So I'm hoping that's the case. Tom in Dallas, who 
obviously enjoyed the sighting of that steam bucket. It sounds like you had a great time with her and her eyelashes. And you'd like to know how to distinguish between the another antelope that you don't get here. Okay, so it seems like we're in a bit of a signal low point here, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get my book out and show you the differences between the dick dick and the steenbuck. Now a dick dick has got a funny nose, it's the most bizarre nose, um, it's almost like an extension of, an ostr of a nose. So that's the main thing to look for with Dick Dick. And there's a whole, there's, there's slightly different subspecies, um, but let's zoom in here, Tebs, onto the side profile shots. And you'll see that they've got this bizarre nose, and even this frontal shot, you can see it dangling over the front of the mouth. And they've got a peculiar small head, which you can also see there. So it's not one that you'd easily confuse a steenbuck and a dick dick. The males have got horns, the females don't, so say, the same as a steenbuck. And I think they're slightly smaller, they ever so slightly smaller than steenbuck. I guess that does look fairly similar to a steenbuck, but it's because the nose, you're looking at at that perfect angle where you can't see that it actually drapes down. And they've got that strange nose to help with thermoregulation. They live in very hot and dry climates a lot of the time and that nose helps them keep cool. Um, here's some other types. So you get the Kirk's Dick Dick, the Piacentini's Dick Dick, sure that's a serious name, Salt's Dick Dick and Gunter's Dick Dick. So I think there's four or five different subspecies. They all look very very similar and but an interesting story about a dick dick, and it kind of relates to a chat we had about Dyker. Let me just take off this poncho, I'm beginning to melt. Um, we had a conversation the other day about how Dyker will hide their young and leave them and go off and feed while their young remain hidden, and, and dick dick will do the same thing. And when I was working up in northern Kenya in a very extreme area called the Takana district, it's dry, semi-arid desert. Oh, shame, I've caused a bit of a traffic jam here. Yeah, this is the main access road for vehicles to access camps. So let me just jump off and let them pass. Um, and apologize. Um, for you guys and we can continue with our addictive story. Now what happens in a lot of African countries is that young local African people who are out in the field tending to their goats or their cattle may stumble across animals like dike or baby dick dick and in some cases bring them to people to look after so sometimes they're doing it because they, they care for the animal and they want to look after it. In this case and I really really don't blame the little kids at all they were planning on eating it and it was tiny I mean less meat, you, you'd, you'd get more meat off a chicken than this tiny little baby uh, dick dick. So what we did is we compensated a little bit of money so that they could, well we actually gave them food instead rather than money. So we gave them food that they could have a good meal with far more uh, nutritional value than this tiny poor diker. And then we took care of it for a while. And it was quite interesting. We actually um, tried to smuggle it from the area where we were working back through uh, Wilson Airport which is in Nairobi and we were transporting it in a backpack of all things because we didn't want everyone to know what we we're doing it was myself and, and a friend and he could take it back to the area where he lived further uh, kind of south of, of Turkana where the same dick dick also occurs so he was going to reintroduce it into a family of dick dick that live, into, live in his garden and obviously this one being so small and hand raised for a couple of weeks before we leave, uh, finished that project up in Turkana had become hugely accustomed to us and we couldn't just leave it there. So we took it with us on a short kind of one and a half hour flight in the backpack sitting at our feet. It was completely relaxed 
And then we got to the, the, Wilson, the Wilson Airport, which is a small kind of domestic airport in Kenya that you'll fly to most of your safari camps out of. It's not the main Jomo Kenyatta International Airport. And they'd done the most bizarre thing. They'd started making people who've landed at the airport go through the customs check and put everything through the, the uh, x-ray machine. So we had been walked out of the airport only to go back through the x-ray machines back into the airport only to leave again. And it was the first time this had ever happened and obviously myself and my friend Rob were not prepared for this. Thankfully he was a Kenya Wildlife Services warden and he had done a lot of work uh, in Kenya. He was quite a lot older than me and he had worked in various national parks dealing with the, 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 the game guards there and also dealing with problem animals that escaped uh, and were causing uh, damage to, to, to people's lives and also their crops. So he was an official Kenya Wildlife warden. Thankfully he had his card with him because when the dyke, uh, when the dick dick went through the x-ray machine, the person sitting at the desk almost fell off their chair and understandably called us up and said, what on earth are you doing with this animal in a backpack? I mean, the least you could do is put it in a box. And uh, we just explained our, our situation. And what was really wonderful is that the head of the airport came through and actually said that we need more people to take care of our wildlife in this country. So it all ended up well. And thankfully, we didn't have to pay any bribes to get through, which is typically the case of getting out of any of those kinds of situations in Africa. Lots of bribery and corruption out here. Um, that was an unfortunate scenario to find yourself in being caught smuggling a dick dick through an airport. I should actually show you a picture of it. I'll find it on my phone and get it ready for when you come back to us, but you are heading. So Scott's been telling you a wonderful story. In the meantime, Viam and myself are stuck in a traffic jam. <laughs> hey, buddy. Tortoises have right of way out here. <laughs> Those skaty back legs. Quite an old tortoise. This is a leopard tortoise. It's not the same one as we saw before. Always fascinating how fast they come out after the rain. Not how fast they walk, though. It's very much put an impediment as to our forward progress. Here you go, dude. Thank you. Hmm. Contemplating the bank with trepidation. Up, up, up. Come on. You can do it. You can do it. <laughs> Whoopsie. Bit of a slip. Hmm. Easy. Easily done. Now, leopard tortoise like this, I wouldn't claim to be an expert at aging tortoises, but I would say that this one is easily 20 years old. They grow very, very slowly. So to see one of this size is actually pretty lucky. We don't spend too much time with him though. We've got lions to locate. I'm going back to the last place that I saw the tracks, and I'm going to shoot off in a different direction because obviously they didn't pop out where I expected them to. Those astonishingly large Nkuhuma feet. I just want to have a quick chat on the Game Drive channel. I just want to clarify which lines it is they found on Buffles Hook. Well, we have some news on the lion update front, and I'm going to send you over to Scott so that he can tell you himself. Welcome back, everyone. We've got some unfortunate news. The lion have crossed out into Sibambili along this road. I'm hoping to try and find you a track, but 
It's surprisingly difficult in this kind of hard road, flat light. There was one perfect track that Doug from Seba Billy just drove over on his way into the siphon. But they are literally 60 meters away at a small little pan. Apparently they are looking back east, which is towards us. And maybe they will come home to Juma after they've quenched their thirst at that little water hole. Um, sadly, they're not going to be able to show you a track. Quite a busy road, this and All the tracks that were easy to see at one stage, I'm sure, have now been flattened. Um, but good prospects. The lions could well head back towards us. Um, and Doug said he will be sure to let us know. So let's hope. But to be honest, let's go and look for something else. At the end of the world, there's lots of other animals. And after the wonderful lion show we got yesterday, I don't mind leaving the lions to sleep there. Obviously, if they were hunting buffalo, it would be a little bit more difficult to just accept. And that's why a sleeping lion is far better to hear over the radio than one that's actively hunting. Which there are currently north of us in Papazook. There is a Talamati pride, which is a pride with two males that spend a lot of time with them at the moment called the Salati males and there's also five lioness and eight little cubs eight cubs anyway hopefully they'll start coming further south but they tend to camp quite far north of our northern boundary but they were busy showing some interest in zebra that would be wonderful to watch Hopefully it won't be too long before our traverse area gets extended. Our boss is doing everything imaginable to try and acquire more land for us, but it's not as easy as it seems, but it appears that hopefully he's going to crack a code and work his way into some more traversing area for us. Um, but we're just going to have to wait patiently for that to happen. I will literally be doing cartwheels the day that it happens because this is certainly the longest time I've been cooped up in such a small area of Travers. <clears throat> and it takes a bit of getting used to. There are certainly benefits to it, and I must say that. There are benefits to having a small Travers area. You get to know it intimately. You, you really do understand every little inch of it. But there comes a time where you'd also like a little bit more turf to explore. to know where I got my one-eyed snake bracelet from. It used to have two eyes. The other one's just fallen out. And interesting story. This there. You can see the snake's even got a mouth. Look at how cool that is. And um, no teeth, though. It's fangless, non-venomous. It's a friendly snake. And this was actually melted down in a pot in front of me. Not a pot. It was a baked bean tin, which has actually got quite a high uh, kind of resolution. That's the wrong word. But it's not easy to melt the tin of a baked bean. Whereas I think aluminium, which is the metal that was melted, um, was put inside. Little pieces of aluminium were put into this little baked bean tin. And a small fire was made by a Samburu blacksmith. Samburu people are a tribe in central Kenya. Really tough people. And this guy was a Goliath. He was a brute. Of a, of a human who had walked, I think, seven hours from his village to come and perform this little uh, bracelet making for our guests that we were taking through a wonderful camp up in northern Kenya uh, that my friend owns and runs called Sarara. And it's one of my favorite places in Kenya. So the blacks blacksmith came along and he melted down this aluminium into in this baked bean pot with a goat skin blower. So it's basically two bladders made of goat skin and then 
what they'll do is they'll each bladder individually putting huge amounts of oxygen through the fire creating an incredibly fierce flame that burns this or melts down this metal and then what he did is let me actually jump out and show you what he did because it was it's quite difficult to explain um jump out on the left here tibbs um what he did once the metal was melted in this little baked beans and he made a little rift in the sand so he he went like that and then in the middle like this he created a spot to pour the molten metal into so he poured it in here and that immediately creates a kind of long piece and as it starts to cool he then had a small anvil that he had ca carried for seven hours from his village and started hammering it into this round shape and then flattened out the head and usually what happens and it's a kind of kenyan jewelry decoration is that the <clears throat> The, the terminal points of the bracelet will be in the shape of a diamond, similar to the, the shape of the snake's head, and it will meet another diamond. And what the girls will do is they'll wear them quite high up on their arms, they'll wear them kind of up on their bicep or on their sh uh, elbow joints, and each diamond will meet in the center. So I just told them to flatten out the other diamond and make it into a snake's tail and then obviously put in spots for eyes that we super glued some beads into, and then he obviously made the little mouth. So it was handmade in front of me. What he did to create the little scales was hammer with kind of like a broken screwdriver all the way around in order to make the little scales. And that was a cool experience. Our guests loved it. They got bracelets made and some of them bought their belts to get beaded like this or like uh, their denim jackets and got them blinged out with some the rural beadwork, really cool stuff. Good. So that's where the bracelet came from. The Matthews Mountain Range in northern Kenya. Beautiful, beautiful parts of the planet where dick dick and leopard are plentiful. And you would actually see the dick dick being consumed quite regularly there by a female leopard who was very habituated with the vehicles. <laughs> Apologies for the somewhat adult-like words that were used that were getting some of you guys a little bit flustered. And that certainly wasn't the intention. I'm sure now that you've got some fresh air, you're thinking and seeing clearly again. Okay, well, we're going to send you back to Jamie. And next time you see us, I'm going to have a leopard for you. <laughs> now, since our lions have pulled a sneaky maneuver upon us, I've decided to come and check the more open areas of Juma. Hopefully, the sable hasn't pulled the same trick on us. I know that they like nice open clearings. So I'm keeping a close eye out for them. And how exciting would that be? We began to know that this is not a sable. This is a relative of Scott's mistaken sable, but it's not actually a sable. Hello, Kudu. <laughs> Ever accompanied by ox pickers yeah, grooming through her fur. Yeah. Hello, gorgeous. I found it's amazing. I found one kudu on Juma that is not pregnant. It seems as though every corner I've gone around, every kudu cow that I've stopped at has been pregnant. This one isn't. And Deek 
curse. You were wondering what antelope has fangs or canine teeth. Um, in terms of their dentition, very few of them have well-developed fangs. They have flat incisors using for, used for nibbling away at the grasses and the trees that they munch on. And then obviously the most important part for them are those long rows of molars at the back. And what I'll do for you is I'll have a look and see if I can't find a jawbone or a skull somewhere and we can have a look at the teeth of the different antelope species. They all share a very similar tooth structure. which is largely the incisors situated in the front with the gap then towards the molars at the back. I'm trying to think if I have a picture. Oh, I was looking for a picture in one of my books until I realized that due to the rain, I had turfed all of my books out into a sheltered cover. So I'm not carrying any with me at the moment, unfortunately. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari. And Sabrina is one of our 12-year-old viewers who is very, very keen on the wildlife that she's been watching on the show and has all kinds of exciting future plans that I've been discussing with her. But Sabrina, you wanted to know if we get oryx here. We don't. They are situated in the more arid areas. So around the western edge of the country, the sort of northwestern corner towards the Kalahari, and then up north from there into Botswana and Namibia. Now there's a species known as the Chemsbok, which is an oryx species, that are absolutely incredible to look at. And they're one of my, they must be one of my top favorite antelope species. It's a pity that we don't get them here because they are spectacular to look at. They've got striking dark shapes. And what I'm actually going to try and do, oh, I keep forgetting I don't have my books. It's such an automatic, reflex to go and look for a picture to show you. Sorry, I don't have a picture to show you. So the oryx, for those of you who don't know, they have those huge long horns, a meter wide or a meter long, so three feet long, that are essentially spears. And both the male and the female have them. Now we spoke earlier about the way that they are related to the sable in their own way, in terms of size and stocky build. And again, both males and females, because they live in arid open areas, have horns that they can use to fiercely protect their offspring and themselves. And when a, an oryx or a chemsbok comes under attack, they bow down onto their knees and they drop their horns forward as essentially it's like a barrier of spears when the whole herd does that. They are incredible animals to watch. And what was fascinating is recently in a reserve around the Kalahari, they released a pack of wild dogs for the first time into that area in who knows how many years, a very long time. A nice big area, so they have plenty of space to run, which we know wild dogs do need to run. And obviously there's quite a few projects involved in reintroducing them to, this, uh, to their previous range and habitat. And nobody ever expected one of their kills to be an oryx species. They always thought that it would be a little bit too big for the wild dog to take on, but actually they managed, they started becoming specialists in hunting and avoiding those scything horns. They are really intense antelope and so striking. And then just on the subject of antelope, Mercedes, you were wondering if we get Oribi in this area. Oh, sorry, it wasn't Mercedes, it was Monkey Man. Monkey Man was wondering if we get Oribi, quite a long-legged antelope, fairly similar in appearance or about the size of an impala. And not in this particular area. Again, different range, different habitat. They're more adapted towards the, the forested areas and the, um, the more coastal areas of the country. So if you go down into KwaZulu Natal or the Eastern Cape, you're more likely to find Oribi there. And unfortunately, this morning, our weather seems to be playing havoc with our comms system. 
I'm not sure if it's the cloudiness or if there's some other reason for it. But just to let you know, if I ignore any, if I ignore your questions, it's just because some of them are not making it through to me. try something interesting because Scott does have his books with him so what we're gonna do is we're going to I'm gonna talk over while Scott shows you a picture of a famous book so here we go and there you go you can see how enormous the horns are luckily we have teamwork here to help us out And now, next, next page is to have a look at the Oruby that Monkey Man asked us about. There we go. Teamwork. Teamwork at Wild Earth. New and inventive ways of solving unexpected problems that arise along the way. <laughs> Thank you, Scott, wherever you may be, for your assistance in that matter. You can see what I mean about the Gems book in particular, or the Oryxes. Powerful antelope, taller at the shoulder even than a sable, one of the largest species that we get out here. Since this little bird is being terribly obliging, a beautiful European roller and with this camera in particular it's always wonderful to stop and have a look at the closer details of the bird species that we see including that hooked beak just at the tip there powerful solid which makes this one of the or an insect out here's worst nightmare proficient at catching things like bees and wasps similar to the bee eaters and then swiping their beak repeatedly along the side of a branch Ooh, what was that and it's very common to see them perched up at this medium level at which point they then dive down and grab any kind of cricket anything that they might find wandering through the grass and a rainy morning like this morning is great for a, a european roller like this one it means that the insects are going to start making an appearance much like the tortoises were coming out of their hiding places where they've been trying to escape the heat and the dryness also a bird with well-developed rectal bristles around its beak now this is a tiny but fierce predator of the skies and apparently scott has found a huge predatory bird. As Jamie says, this is a monster of a raptor and its wingspan can reach up to two and a half meters. This is the martial eagle. It's an eagle we don't see very often here. And it's capable of hunting prey as big as baby impala, diker, steenbuck, certainly dick dick up in East Africa. Right now, though, it's looking like most raptors will be in this cool, cloudy, wet weather. It's not suited to them. They prefer flying effortlessly using the hot air thermals. But as it sits perched here, it allows us for some wonderful opportunities to take a closer look at it. You can see its massive talons dangling down from its middle toe there of its right foot and that bird's talons and claws will be far bigger than my hand to give you an idea of how big they are perfect for seizing their prey they will also hunt small animals like scrub hares monkeys and a lot of the game birds franklin and guinea fowl 
Let's try and get a little bit closer. Again, because it's quite cool weather, it may be relaxed or less likely to fly off. Problem is, I don't know how good our angle's gonna be as we get closer. We can't get much better than this. Hello to the Siberia Zumi who's noticed its white tuxedo-like colorations. And that's a great way of describing it. Look at that claw. Also got a beady yellow eye that you might be able to pick up, as well as, oh, look at that, and staring straight down the barrel at us. Awesome. Also got quite a big prominent crest. And what I'll do is I'll pull out a picture of one in a book just to show you what they look like up close and personal. They've also got a kind of brown speckling on their breast. It's not entirely white. Um, and um, certainly one of the most awesome predators of the sky that we get here. My favorite is probably the crowned eagle, the forest equivalent of this sky. The martial eagle is well suited to hunting out in open areas. And it's at the top right here. This page has got the heavy duty birds of prey. So the marshal here, you can see the brown fleckings on his chest as well as the crest there. This is another superior raptor, the Varose eagle, formerly known as the black eagle. And again, we don't get these here, sadly. They like very rocky cliff areas. Then on the bottom left, we have my favorite, the crowned eagle. And incredibly pretty and incredibly ferocious hunter the crowned eagle. Again, we don't see them here in the Sabi Sands, and one of the best places to see them is right up in the northern corner of the Kruger Park in an area called Pefiri. And while we're talking about the Kruger Park and how it works, I may as well show you this distribution map here um, to give you an idea of the shape of the Kruger. It's a very long and thin, so I'm just looking for the branch. Um, it's a very long and thin reserve, but that's 300 kilometers in length. And it opens up to Zimbabwe to the north and Mozambique to the east. So it's a transfrontier park. We are situated somewhere in this tiny little corner here where you get a right angle in white. We are in that little corner and we are literally a little pinprick. We are 60,000 hectares, the Sabi Sands, of close on 4 million hectares, which creates the Transfrontier National Park. What you can see here is probably about 3 million. We get add an extra million with Zimbabwe and Mozambique. And on top of that, the Sabi Sands is 60,000. Like I say, in our traverse area is about 2,000 hectares with Juma and Arethusa combined. So we are li literally a little pinprick with relation to how big this wonderful wilderness area is. Mr. Marshall Eagle, you don't want to go and catch something for us? I don't blame you in this weather for not being up and about though. Well, sacrosanct, you are one lucky individual, and you were lucky enough to see a martial eagle swoop down, catch a mongoose, and fly off with it. And it's something that I always think about, and I've discussed it a couple of times with you guys, and that is that it's so difficult to film birds of prey that we've actually got very little idea of how awesome they are, and few of us have ever seen them hunting in action. I know all my time in the bush, I've hardly seen these animals hunting. And you may see them swooping down, but at the perfect moment, the bushes will get in the way or the prey will disappear. They're obviously 
not easy to follow because they're flying and we're based on the ground. But maybe with the way technology is going, we are in the future going to be able to gain an insight into their hunting and be there to capture some incredible moments as they do hunt. But Sacrosan, very happy to hear you got lucky. With that, the closest thing I've seen to some awesome eagle footage was a video of, I think it's a golden eagle. It's a massive, massive eagle somewhere in the USA, I believe, somewhere in America. And there was a guy playing with his family on like this big open park. And he had his camcorder out and he was filming his tiny little kid, maybe two years old, I don't know, stumbling around. Not very big and not very uh, coordinated. Uh, just wobbling about on this big grassy plain and the wife was probably somewhere there too and then you know just a bird soaring up above him so I thought he would combine his family documentary with a word of wildlife so he panned up and started filming this massive eagle soaring above them and then all of a sudden the eagle swooped down and actually picked up his kid and flew a few meters into the air with it then dropped the kid and carried on flying off but imagine that um, horrifying and I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy because imagine how helpless you must feel with an eagle flying away with your kid but there's an important lesson in that and it gives you a good indication of how big some of these animals are and what prey they are capable of taking down um, it's not uncommon for martial eagles and crowned eagles to catch um, people's dogs, uh, quite often people's pets get taken by the crown eagles and the martial eagles, especially your smaller dogs. <clears throat> Nikki's trying to remind me about a video we watched of a, a bird of prey attacking a, a goat. And I can't remember what kind of goats or what kind of bird it was, but it may be somewhere in like the Himalayas or somewhere where you get these mountain goats. It was a big goat and mountain goat of some description. And this bird of prey, that's me being lazy, I don't want to do that. Um, but this bird of prey was uh, not nearly big enough to take on a goat, but it tried to. And it, landed on this goat's back and tumbled down this rocky mountain with the goat in claw until eventually the goat managed to kind of shake the bird of prey loose but again a remarkable uh, sequence of footage but we we don't get to see it as often as you'd like other than those few moments of absolute luck and brilliant camera work where occasionally birds of prey have been captured in action anyway i'm going to move this buffalo thorn out the road and while i do that you're going to jump back onto jamie's vehicle That's awesome. It's not often that we get to have a look at a martial eagle. It's actually quite unusual to see them, although they are fairly dominant in this area. But an enormous bird, definitely one of my favorite eagle species. I think second only to the black eagle or the rose eagle, which definitely falls on the top of my list. Unfortunately, not one that we would see out here. They much prefer the mountain tops and the crevices there like to build their nests on cliff faces. Much like the martial eagle, they're very similar in size and bulk. They rely on the crushing power of their weight at the end of a flight, and they hunt also capable of hunting little antelope, as well as rock hyraxes. Who's hiding here? Come on, Rusty. Please play nicely, there we go. Sitting in the top of the tree. The smaller raptor species. It's a juvenile. It's a juvenile goshawk. Awesome. Looks like a juvenile dark chanting goshawk to me. It's slightly orangey beak, bare legs tells us that it's definitely not an eagle species as well as the size. And the size puts it around the goshawk level. But it hasn't yet got the dark grey colour or the banding around the face of the tail. 
Luckily, I've just discovered Brent's bird book, so I'll be able to double check that. But I'm fairly certain it is a juvenile goshawk. And it's amazing how long it takes the juveniles of the birds of prey species to actually gain the coloration of the adults. In the case of bataliers, it's somewhere in the region of seven to eight years before they acquire or before they reach sexual maturity. how the alphabet works so I'm struggling to find gossip oh there we go and what would be nice is if it would kindly turn and face us so that we could see if it has banding across the front of the chest come on buddy don't you want to turn around and say hello The only thing that throws me off slightly is the dark colored eye. Goshawks usually have lighter colors. No, it's got to be, it's got to be a juvenile dark chanting goshawk. Nothing else I can think of that could, could be at that particular size. And that pale color that's starting to come through. Oh, it's the rain is coming again. Gentle drizzle. <laughs> Meredith, after Scott's story of the smuggled dick tick, dick tick, Meredith was wondering if I have any stories of animals smuggling that I would like to share, or if perhaps a lady doesn't tell. Sorry, Meredith. In this case, we are distracted by these spurring or sparring in parlor. back this way guys I might pop out in the open there nope we're going back again loud on the right Liam hears a, a squirrel shouting I think quite possibly in response to the presence of that bird of prey come on Impala continue your game This is what having a bachelor buddy is all about. Practicing the skills you're going to need for later on in life. Watching them dance around each other like this. <laughs> They're playing. They are actually playing in the rain. There's nothing serious about this particular fight. You can see there's it's almost light-hearted in their body language. The one skips away and then the other one skips forward and taking it in turns, but not actually really seriously making contact with each other. Bit of a clash there. Skipping backwards and forwards. one stuck in the branch there. <laughs> and although they are playing, as I said, it is very good practice for building up your coordination and your fighting moves that you will need in May when the rut time starts for the Impala. in Oklahoma while we watch these two antelope species clashing quite seriously actually now and they're making contact at least he wants to know what makes a deer and an antelope different and we're actually they're using one of the main differences between antelope and deer those horns sitting on the top of their head only antelope have them and they grow from a growth plate and are solid bone and they're permanent throughout their lives 
covered in a, ker a keratin sheet. They're in solid living tissue that will be on their heads the entire time so that they don't shed their horns at any point. Whereas with deer, the main difference is that deer have antlers and that are shed usually once a year around the end of breeding season once all of the ewes have been mated with. But again, I mean, they're very similar animals and they have essentially evolved in different areas in different ecological niches. Of course, antelope species more adapted for the hot and drier climates, whereas the deer species are more geared towards cooler climes or are more capable of co coping. I can tell you if we had the amount of snow that certain areas of the states have been getting, our antelope species would not be able to survive it. Game over. Oh no, game's continuing actually. It's just continuing around the back of a bush. And Meredith, since I can't actually ignore your question, you want to know if a lady never tells, I'm quite happy to tell you my smuggling stories. I've never tried to smuggle an animal through the airport, although I did help a boy smuggle, smuggle his pet snake on once onto a plane. Um, that doesn't count because it wasn't my animal, so it's fine. Um, he was hiding it up his sleeve and he was sitting next to me in the seat and we I would act as a lookout, but I was very young. I can't, it must have been the one first time I ever flew on my own. I probably throughout my childhood attempted to smuggle many a creature into the house. And I do remember having a pet mouse bird that had fallen out of its nest that I adopted. Its name was Pidgey for some unknown reason. I was very young at the time is all I could offer. And Pidgey, I used to smuggle into school. Oh, <laughs> Part of racing around like maniacs. I was trying to read. I was trying to get around to them on the other side of Treehouse Dam. Luckily, Liam is on top of his game as a cameraman. His face sprints around like mad creatures. Ah, the rain has come. The rain has returned to us once again. So yes, I smuggled a mouse bird, it was a speckled mouse bird, for those of you keen birders. Not one that occurs around in this area, but it's very common in Johannesburg. And I used to smuggle this bird into school because I was convinced that they would never let me take it in and it had to be fed. It had to be fed every couple of hours because it was a young baby bird. And when the teacher did find out, I used to hide it under my ponytail. I used to have a low ponytail and keep it there, but of course, birds cheap. They make a noise. And naturally I got caught out within the first few minutes. Um, and the teacher actually then gave me full permission to keep the bird at school and actually helped me feed it and gave me advice. So there you go, at least South African, the wonderful South African teachers can be very understanding. I've smuggled hamsters into school before, up in blazer sleeves. And there was a enormous black market trade in silkworms when I was a child as well. Something that I'm sure all South Africans who've grown up around in the, the cities can relate to. We all had a box of silkworms that we used to feed with mulberry leaves. I can hear alarm calls somewhere, but I'm just gonna, I'm not sure if it's a bird of prey they're responding to, but if it ties in with VM squirrel, you never know what you might find. absolutely soaking wet and still with big smiles on our faces. Joseph would like to know what the best part of this job is and what the best part of Safari Live is. The best part, both of those are really difficult questions and probably you'll find each of us has a different answer. For me the best part of the job is the fact that you're never bored. It, nothing is ever boring, no day is ever the same. You never know what to expect. You know, it's 
never know, to know about the world that I inhabit. It's what my I'm just going to go through this dip. one has caught me out. One more time, let's try that again. Joseph, you were wondering about the best aspect of the job. I said that it was learning something new every day and always experiencing different things and never knowing what to expect. The best part of the live safaris, I think, is the fact that they're live. So short of actually being here and experiencing them, they it's happening. There's an excitement like watching a live sports game. And the fact that it's unpredictable makes it even more fun because who knows what might happen. You might have a leopard walk straight out into the road in front of you. I say hopefully. No, not this time. That would have been yeah. We've had so many moments like that this week. I thought it might particularly happen. Um, and then, of course, the fact that even if you are here as a guide, as a guest, you're here for a short period of time, whereas these live safaris, you actually get to extend it. So you get to watch stories play out of individual characters, individual creatures like Karula or the Mkuhuma lionesses. And you get to watch months, years at a time and find out what happens to individuals. How cool is that? It's, it's like the world's longest documentary. And of course, we can't make it up. We can't fool you and we can't script you, apart from, of course, our green screens and the fact that sometimes it gets lighter in the morning. But apart from that, we can't actually make any of it at the same time we are. The same time we are. And then, of course, there's the interactions and the questions that you all send through, which is definitely one of my favorite aspects to it. Look at this, it's raining on the green screen. <laughs> and cue rain. Cue rain. <laughs> and what we actually have is a couple of people on either sides with hose pipes, and they gently sprinkle us to make it a more realistic effect. <laughs> I am joking, just to clarify, I am completely joking. There are no green screens, and in fact, because we are in a drought, there's very little green at all. Um, that we can, okay, apart from all the trees, there's some green there, but they're not green screens, and there are not people standing with hose pipes spraying beer and myself to create the rain effect. That I can promise you. <laughs> we are soaked to the bone for the joys of live safaris. And I can promise you, if we were not live, that fall would certainly have been edited out. Oh my goodness. Yay, it's, um, it's collecting again. It's <laughs> collecting around the lower back. Yeah, the poncho. If I had a poncho, I forgot the ponchos, the giant blue ponchos. I was a bit worried though that if the wind picked up, I might sail away. Like something out of Mary Poppins. is we've covered most of Juma this morning. 
amazing how the elephant herds come and go. Brent's had a couple of sightings with easily a hundred elephants. All of a sudden they've all vanished. One of them was outside the camp last night, outside Liam's window in fact apparently, keeping him awake, cheering and swapping midnight stories. to get very damp. Are we okay back there, Liam? No. Equipment okay. Liam's just preparing to put on the final aspect of our rain cover, which is a I, don't, I hesitate to call it a skirt. Tablecloth. A tablecloth. A tablecloth that wraps around the base of the camera. This forms that final seal as the rain is starting to pour down. <laughs> um, and as we carry on, Michael, you were wondering, and Michael is 17, one of our 17-year-old viewers, you were wondering if you have to have any training to become a, a guide like we are. And the answer is yes. The nice thing is that there's different ways of training. There's different experiences that people have had in order to become a guide. But yes, you have to pass certain exams. You have to do certain courses. You have to be first aid qualified. There's a red-headed weaver. Please don't fly away. Please don't fly away. Oh, don't fly away. It's the first red-headed weaver I've seen in ages. Hello, beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful bright red head, the breeding plumage of the male, like a little tomato hopping through the tree. And we definitely haven't seen many of these around, so for those new viewers working on your bird list, here's one to add to the list, a red-headed weaver. That's called uh -huh, because of the red head. I'm not sure whether that needed any sort of clarification. It does. Look at it, it's beautiful. Awesome, well done, Viam. Yay. Very cool. Like that yellow one, the female. That yellow one was the female. The, the one hopping around the side there was the female of the red-headed weaver. She's much more drab. So guys, let us know if that's a first for your bird list. I bet you there's quite a few of you who didn't have that. And you've noticed particularly this year a serious deficiency in the species of weaver. And I spoke to a friend of mine, Emma, who works closer to the mountains, chatting a bit about bird species. And they've had a marked increase in the bird species that they've seen. And I think that's because they've had a bit more rain than we have. How cool was that though? Red-headed weaver for a new bird for many of you, I'm sure. Hello, boy. You got distracted by the weaver and let you get away. Sorry. But that weaver was just so interesting. And as he wanders off, Michael, you were asking about the training. Yes, you do have to have training. You have to be qualified in terms of first aid. You have to have special driver's licenses in certain circumstances. Mostly what counts is time spent in the bush. I learned more in my first month working as an actual guide than I did in the entire time in which I trained. And that's not because my training was bad, my training was wonderful. It's just that doing it day in and day out is a fantastic way of learning. You just have to work, as with anything, you just have to work your way up. The fantastic thing about guiding is also that you could move anywhere and learn about a brand new set of birds, a brand new set of plants just within South Africa alone. If I were to move off somewhere, for example, to the Eastern Cape, it would come with a whole variety of new challenges for me. One of 
the aspect where our experience comes in handy in terms of deciding the answer to Jonathan's question. So Jonathan, first of all, you want to know how we decide where we're going to go when we go out on the average three hour game drive. And picking your routes is, it's a combination of luck and experience and what you've observed from spending time in this particular area. So we, how do we know where to go? We Either we know where sightings were and we pick where they might have crossed onto the property. Possibly we just go and explore an area where we know that there's water on a hot day, although we seem to have plenty of it falling from the sky at the moment. And Jonathan, you were also wondering how far we might try travel on an average game drive. So an average game drive, let's say we don't, for example, yesterday we had the Lions at quarantine. Between Scott and myself, we can't have driven more than maybe four miles between us. And that was because we had sightings very much in the vicinity. But probably on average, I would say that I drive about between seven to 10 miles maybe. And that's on, a, that's on quite a busy day, covering quite the extensive road network that we have. It's all about, some of it's luck, some of it's experience. A lot of it is luck, if I'm completely honest. Sometimes, and we've had a lot of it. The last few days, we've, or the last few weeks actually, we've been incredibly lucky with the sightings we've had. dark male giraffe there and he wandered off fairly quickly he wasn't feeling particularly like being on the camera but James Richards you were wondering how that dark male got on with the female that he was courting and we were watching these this pair along with a young calf that was belonged to the female we watched them for quite a few days in a row and we had to admire that male's persistence because he constantly tried to get the attention and affection of the female. Much to his disappointment, she never really reciprocated his feelings. And James, I don't know. I think there's a chance that he did manage. We will we'll just never know the answer. While I go off and check one last ditched effort around the clearings of Impala Plains, let's get an update from Scott. Joined us at a good time. We are about to take Imnisi Boulevard. An Imnisi is a hyena. Or an Mpisi, or further north, in East Africa, an Mfisi. So M N I S I or M P I S I or M F I S I. The hyena. And this is the boulevard that will lead us to their home. Wonderful, actually. Little beautiful open area. This we drive through to get to the den. Hadn't spent much time here before this den was discovered. And we all owe James Henry, who's on leave now. A big thank you for finding this den for us. I'm told he is back for his first drive on the 31st of this month, which a lot of you will be looking forward to, as are we. Wonderful guy to have around camp, both for work purposes and for social purposes. Looks like he's been having a great leave so far, recharging the batteries, regaining his sanity after being stuck in the bush for a very long stint. He can leave somewhat deranged after a long stint in the bush, not seeing too clearly. Good. Well, let's go on a little tour of what's happening here. There's one, possibly a mother, lying at the entrance to 
The den where cubs are, there's another little cub. Looks like possibly November. On the left, he was, or she was born in November. And then in the center, there's a adult chewing on a branch. It's quite thick. There's also another cub running along there. That looks like it's one of the Decembers and the other December following behind it. Those are twins. And there's another sub-adult coming along over there, a youngster, possibly June. Hard to keep track of who's who. And then further to the right of that, there's what looks to be the matriarch, the alpha female of the clan, with those raggedy ears of hers. I think that's her. Some of you guys are really keeping very close tabs on this hyena den, and we thank you for that. It's really helpful. And they're enjoying playing around in the cool weather. Diana Giles would like to know if these animals are scavengers. And yes, they've certainly been painted in that light, that all they're good for is stealing. But that's not entirely the case. In this area, though, of South Africa, I think it's fair to say that hyenas do scavenge more than that they hunt. But even that is not confirmed. It's because we don't spend time or much time out at night. And therefore, it would be wrong for us to assume that they aren't hunting while we're sleeping. But because of the high leopard density here, I think they do focus on stealing from leopard quite often. On one occasion, though, Diane, the Juma waterhole did capture hyena chasing an impala into the waterhole, and then when it tried to escape out of the water's edge, it got consumed by the hyena. So they can hunt, and in some areas of Africa, they've actually been documented to hunt more successfully than the lion, and the lion actually steal more from the hyena than vice versa. So roles will be reversed and all predators will scavenge. Leopards will scavenge from other leopards, they'll scavenge from cheetah, lion will scavenge from anything that they can overpower, which is just about everything. So everything's a scavenger and a thief archer when the opportunity presents itself. But hyenas, yes, are kind of specialized, I think you could say, in scavenging. In this area, like I said, they're mainly from leopard and they will very seldomly interact with lion. There is one massive clan, though, further west of us that sounds like they are professionals at chasing lion off their, their prey. And it happened once, I think, with the Nkuhumas who were scattered about somewhere on Sibambili and they got taught a lesson by these hyena. I'm going to try and reposition and get us across into that action there. It looks like they're having a great time. And watch, as we get around there, they're going to come play on this side of the mound. <laughs> <clears throat> so here we very seldomly, sadly, see hyena lion interaction as, uh, as it would be a wonderful thing to witness. I've seen very seldomly. Okay, so this is one tree, the one on the left that we shouldn't drive over, so we're just going to squeeze past it. It's called the Tamburti tree. It's a hardwood. So that's why we don't want to drive over it. Somebody has already, but... This. Comes literally come running down to us to investigate. And let's see if its cousins don't come and join. It looks like they're going to tips. Here comes a sub adult. And they can be hugely curious, hyena. Uh, it looks like these guys are having a serious wrestling matchup. They're possibly jostling for a nipple to drink from. Just going to move forward a little bit more. Let's 
to Liberty Ann. Let me ask you now exactly the definition of a sub-adult, and I'm glad you asked because I don't know the answer to that, and it's something we discussed the other day. When do you officially become a sub-adult as opposed to an adult? And I guess it will vary on the individual species and how long it lives for, but that's the best I can give you. Look at that. That's awesome. So that must be an older cub playing with its mother and the, the next generation. I'm guessing that that's the case. And look at them all just loving this cool weather, piling onto one another. I'm going to see if I can hold back a tiny bit. Sorry to ruin your fun. That's a bit better, right? Oh, it looks like the cub's coming to say hello again. Hello, oh, you. Difficult to know where to look in these situations because there's just action everywhere, but this one is definitely winning the camera time after its close investigation of us. Uh, and they're covered in a fine layer of mud. Oh, we've got another visitor. Aren't you guys brave this morning, eh? <laughs> this is a great example of how wild animals very slowly become habituated to us. We put ourselves in their presence without interfering in any way. And from a very young age, hyena like this, lion and leopard and all the animals, the impala, the elephants, will slowly <clears throat> but surely understand that we are not here to harm them. And that's why we get such great visuals of them, just like that hyena earlier on this morning, coming so close to the vehicle that Tibbs couldn't even film it. Well, it's quite interesting, Tibbs. I'm just going to ask you to show the other two watching on as their very brave sibling comes so close. <laughs> You guys can come as well. You should all come and say hello. Yeah. Shame one's not too sure about it. The one highest up using as much cover as possible to sneak up to us. Absolutely awesome. Tim's quickly, if you don't mind going up onto the burrow there, there's a serious commotion going on with the mother and this young sub-adult cub teenager. You can use whichever of those you prefer. Cub, sub-adult or teenager, not too sure which is which. Hello, Gex Gecko, and you'd like to know if the hyena's smell becomes more pungent when they are wet, similar to that of a dog. And not that I can tell. Tebs, can you smell any difference? Not really. Um, they're not the smelliest of animals, um, and it's not often you smell the scent of a hyena, unless you poke your nose into their den sites. At least, at least those are my nostrils. <coughs> So no, they're not the smelliest of animals, wet or dry. What's interesting here is look at how this youngster is attacking the feet of its mother. Now, even though it's playing, we've seen this happen in a more serious fight, and it's all very good practice. Even the biting on the ears that we saw a little bit earlier, that's the main point that a hyena will attack. The ears are a good spot, spot and the feet. If you can make your opponent lame by crippling them and hurting their feet, that's a very good start to winning a battle. And very often hyena will attack the feet as well as most animals. And that's why you often find rather than an animal fleeing, they lie down on top of their feet to try and protect them being attacked further. And it wasn't long ago that we saw some really, really horrifying images of 
One unlucky hyena who had had its back two feet chewed to a pulp about four or five inches from where its toes would have been all the way up to its ankles, you could say. And it was just a jelly-like mass that she was dragging along behind her. Finally, that large one, whether it's adults or a male, I'm not too sure, but it's had enough. And as it jumped up, I'm not convinced that it was actually a female. And that makes more sense that the sub-adult was getting away with so much bullying a male. This sub-adult that's just disappeared off the right of your screen could be a young female that's been born into a fortunate hierarchical position. I think we should reposition see what's happening on the other side. Hello, Kenna, a new viewer who would like to know if I'm ever concerned about being attacked by a hyena. And I'm glad you sent through your question when you did. Sorry, not Kenna, Tana, because it's prevented us moving off and the hyena have come back. Tana, no, hyena are unlikely to attack humans, especially if you're awake. And what I mean by that is that the majority of hyena attacks... Oh, it looks like it's getting too close for Tibbs to even film. ...humans have been when humans are asleep. Either sleeping with their doors open, sleeping with a flap of their tent open, or passed out in a flower bed somewhere. So those are the times when you will be killed by a hyena. I'm almost certain that nobody's been attacked by a wild hyena when you're awake. And they will flee the scene. As soon as you stand up and clap and shout at them, they will run off. So no, hyena I'm not scared of. Lion and leopard can be different, and even though most of the animals out here will run away when you confront them, lion and leopard have been known on many, many different occasions to hunt and kill humans asleep or awake whereas that is not the case for hyena so one of the less feared animals in my books personally hmm colleen spencer you're interested to know how high can a hyena jump? It's a pity you weren't tuned into a live safari that Peter Pretorius was taking a f couple of months back when we had a hyena trying to jump up and pull a carcass out of a tree that a leopard had hoisted and it landed on its back. It was hilarious and you'd like to know how high they can jump. So that would have been good for you to see. Not very high at all. I'd say maybe a meter off the ground. Um, What's happened? Not too sure. Um, so yeah, not very good jumpers, Colleen. Hmm. Brian, hello. And I've never actually seen a hyena swim, so I do not know how they will be able to swim, Brian. I know that they are more than happy to submerge themselves in water, in muddy wallows to keep cool, far more so than any of the other predators of this area. But, yeah, uh, I've never seen them swimming, so not too sure. It'll be interesting to know how the hyena of Botswana do, because they are good swimmers. Sadly, it's coming to the end of the sunrise safari so i just want to show you some quick pictures of the dick dick that we raised for a while in northern kenya this is such a cool picture it's pronking for joy we were taking it on an evening stroll as we did every evening and morning and it's pronking in the air all four feet and this gives you an idea of maybe i should go this way of how small it is 
They are absolutely tiny and they don't get much bigger than that. To give you an idea, good. Well, everyone, thank you very much for all of your contributions to the Sunrise Safari, the Sunrise Less Safari, because we didn't see the sun. It's been great fun and look forward to the next adventure with all of you. Over to Jamie. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, on this rain-drenched morning where the vultures are stuck at the site of the kill where they cannot take off and thermal around as they would like to even though there's no food left for them to snack on thank you for all of your questions and your comments it's been great having you on board with us so wonderful to have a bit of moisture and thank you to viam for his wonderful camera work and the lovely ladies in fc for all of their great voicing and directing have a great day we'll catch you this afternoon